Hey, welcome to Teo's Trick Taking Table. I'm taking us back to the month of August. It's where we're covering golden old games. We strayed a little bit away from that with the last two videos, but we started with Mazurka, and today we're covering a game I can never pronounce. So bear with me. Uh, it's called Koffer, 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 yes? Koffer, yes? Koffer, yes? Koffer, 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 Koffer? Koifish, coffee jazz. I I just call it coffee jazz. It's much easier to say, and it's much cooler than whatever that was, which is like a win-win for my mouth, really. Uh, it's designed by none other than N slash A. I think they go by Na. They are prolific. Really, uncredited is is the only designer that rivals them in terms of output and probably age. They have a pretty good catalog for being a thousand or older. I think what would be fun is if we ditch this boring set and we go for this month to some place where only old people can go. Let's go to a, an establishment with with alcohol and I mean it's coffee jazz. Let's go. Let's go to a jazz club. I don't know why I'm. I don't know why I'm tiptoeing around this. Let's go to a jazz club. Hey, how's it going? You want to come in here, huh? Yeah, could I get in? How old are you? Oh, about like 200. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, right this okay. way. Thanks. Oh, interesting. This bar has fun lighting. Can I get uh, one alcohol, please? Oh, thank you. You know, using movie magic, I probably could have just put water in here and I've done a few takes now where I've actually been drinking this and I'm starting to feel it. So we're gonna, we're gonna lightly sip for this take uh, <laughs> because I don't think I'm gonna get through final thoughts if, if I don't. So cheers to, cheers to you. Mmm. Oh, it's still, when it touches the, ah, it's still, I never get used to it. Even if it's just like fake sips like that. I never, I never could do shots in, uh, in 21 or over world because I, I, I just, I can't, I can't, I can't, I, I can't, I, I can't, yeah. how do I explain this? It's like going into a pool. I could never dive into a pool, even today. Like I, I go to the steps, I go to the three feet, the four feet, the five feet, but uh, that's not what we're here for. So uh, <laughs> that's the gin, this is the gin talking, the hook. Hook, the hook to coffee jazz, coffee, coffee jazz, is it's a three-player only game, and you will be playing a lot of hands. It's a long game. It's about three hours, three and a half, four hours. It's a long game. It's a marathon. I've seen some people play it over multiple hands, but uh, but uh, back to the hook. The premise is you have these contracts. We talked about contracts with Mazurka. It seems like old games love contracts. But the premise is, you'll get dealt a hand, and you'll be on the hook to choose one of the contracts. Either it's a normal game where a certain suit is trump, or a game where you want high cards, because high is strongest, or a game where you want low cards, because low is strongest, or a game where it bounces back and forth every other trick. Wild. And how it works is just like Mizurka, Maybe check that out. Uh, I don't want to reference it too much if you haven't seen it. But the premise is you will pick one of the contracts for your hand. You'll play out that hand. You'll get a certain amount of points. Then it'll be the next person's turn to bid. You have 12 contracts to fulfill. So you're going to be playing 36 hands. And at the end of it, everyone will get a certain amount of points for that contract in that row. So let's say a certain suit is Trump and you get 40 points, someone else gets 50, and the last person gets 60. So the last person did the best on that contract. You're comparing how well you do each contract. I'm starting to just explain the game at this point. This gin is hitting good. So how about we stop at the hook and I go to the digital table, which was filmed earlier before I started doing, I did like five takes where I was like, like big gulp in this so oof uh anyway uh let's go to the digital table and i'll teach you how to play <laughs> oh my 
gosh. Here we are at the digital table for the implementation of Kofir Yas. This was made by Sean Ross of Haggis fame and Dickery fame and Vidrasa fame. And <laughs> you get the idea. Thank you so much, Sean. The deck in Kofir Yas is going to be 36 cards. There's going to be four suits and the rank is a little bit different. It is using Yas kind of systems. That's why there's Trump suit rank, officer rank kind of movement here, but essentially it is six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and then four face cards. So ace, king, and then instead of like a queen or a jack, it is over and under. Here is the over or over <laughs> and then the under. So again, nine cards in each suit and four suits to make for a 36 card deck. So the game is only for three players and how it works is each player is going to play a hand where they pick which contract they're going to play and then they're going to try to get as many points as possible. So in the deck there is 152 points and then why it says 157 here is because whoever wins the last trick wins five more points. So the flow of the game is someone is going to pick a contract, they have the option to pass if they want to, but we'll go into that a little bit later. Essentially, they're going to pick a contract. It's going to be kind of the left of dealer. So the person whose turn it is to pick a contract is going to look at their hand and pick one of these contracts. So these top four up here, it's just the suit you pick is going to be Trump. The cards in that Trump suit will kind of move around a little bit, but you're playing a game where essentially that's Trump and that's the only thing that's different. The ones down here are a little bit different. So there's no Trump in these. And for this one right here, it means that the highest ranked cards are the strongest. So ace beats everything, then the king. With this though, if you pick this contract, which is the undenuffen, the lowest cards are the strongest. So the six is the strongest, then the seven, then the eight. Slalom is an interesting contract. It starts one way, either up or down. The person who picks it gets to choose. And then every other trick, it changes. <laughs> So a little crazy, I'll get into an example of that a little bit later. With this one, it's called the Gustav, and how it works is it starts either up or down, but the first six tricks are one way, and then the last six tricks are the other way. Pretty wacky. And then the Joker contracts here are just any of these above contracts, but they're just worth more. So again, we'll get into all the kind of details and the scoring. We're just going to jump into a little bit of a hand here. So let's say we are the third person, we're looking at our hand. Maybe we say, let's pick shields as Trump for the contract. Because as you can see right here, if the suit is Trump, the nine and the under are going to be elevated to the strongest cards in that rank. And we have both those cards. So we have the two strongest cards in the game if we do pick shields as Trump. So we'll do that. Whoever picks the contract will lead to the first trick. Kafir Yas is a must follow game, but you may trump if you want to. So let's say that we played this eight, and then let's just drag over the hand and pull down player one's hand. So we're player one right now. So it's must follow. So they either can play into the trick with a flower, or since you can trump if you want to, they could play this trump. So let's say they just followed suit and played that six, and they would come to the second player here. They play the king, so the king is the strongest card. They're just gonna take that, Oop. and then they'll lead to the next trick, so maybe they lead with acorns. Continuing some of the examples here, just to see how trumping works. This player, us, I guess, <laughs> we can play the nine or 10 acorns, but if we play the 10, the other team would win it, and that's 10 points. Because as you can see down here in the black, that is points for that card unless it got turned into trump and then that suit becomes blue so for example this nine since it's trump is actually worth 14 points and not zero so it is acorns so we could play the nine or the ten points if we play the ten we'd lose so we're maybe we're a little nervous let's play instead because we may trump our seven trump coming to this player here again they may trump so they could play the six be kind of a waste for them because they would just lose so maybe they play into the acorn trick and add zero points 
because the opposing team, the us player, who was the declarer, and picked the contract is going to win. So that person would take the trick. Back to us now, if we do lead Trump, it is a must follow game still. So all the players would have to follow suit Trump. There's no kind of way out of it there. But what's interesting is, if you ever have the highest ranked Trump, the under, you don't have to play it if it's pulled out. So flash forward, say it's this middle person here and they lead with a king of Trump and it comes to us, we don't have to follow suit with this highest ranked Trump because this is never pulled out from the must Trump. Super nice if you have it, it's a very helpful card. So we could just, you know, play off suit if we wanted to. So play like this continues. Whoever wins the last trick will get five points. So let's say it was us. Then you would just look through all the cards that you got and count up your points. Again, if the suit isn't Trump, you would just count up the black here. And if it was Trump, you would count the blue underneath. So let's say we got 85 points. So after counting up all the points and those, you would put your total in your column and row corresponding to the contract and who you are. So over here, you would just put 85. So then you would deal, you would move the marker, and now it would be this person over here, their turn to pick a contract. Let's say they don't want to pick a contract. In the game, you can actually push off that duty to the next player, and then they can pick a contract. And if they didn't want it, they could pass it on to us. If we didn't want it, we can pass back to the original person. And at this point, this original person then can't pass anymore and they are essentially put over a barrel, I think is the phrase, and they would have to pick a contract. Fast forwarding to the fourth hand here, let's say it's us again. When you go to pick a contract, you can never pick one you've already done. So even though we have, you know, some pretty good shields here again, we can never pick this as our contract. What's cool about the jokers is you could always pick the joker and then just pick the shield up here as the contract. But again, it would be in the joker section for whatever you get. So say we got like 99, it would go there. And then in the future, we can't pick this joker contract ever again. Before we get to the final scorings, let's cover slalom just to get a good example because it is probably one of the goofier contracts out there. So how it works is the person who makes the contract, let's say it's us, will choose whether we want to start high or low. Let's say high just for now. So you'll lead to the trick. Maybe we play ace because again, in the contracts here, ace is the strongest. If it's high, we would win that trick, take it. And then when we lead the next one, this would flip to low and we could lead the six. And then we're guaranteed to take that as well because now six is the strongest card. So maybe we would take that and then we go back to high and then we would lead this ace. And as you can see, that's kind of the flow of that. If it was Gustav, you would pick high or low and you would do six tricks of that in order. So a little bit harder for sure. Let's jump to final scoring here. And if you could just imagine all the zeros are filled with numbers. So how it works is everyone will have numbers in everywhere. And you're gonna compare how each player did to each other in that row. So you find out who does the lowest. They are gonna get one minus point for the whole game. It's called a potato. And then you're gonna find out who does the best. And they're gonna get one positive point for the whole game. It's called a stick. So you're gonna go through and just do that for everything. So this person got one stick, this person got one potato. Imagine these were filled right. And so you might be wondering why the first group is sectioned like that, and then the second and the third, is because in the first group, you can get either one stick or one potato or nothing. But in later groups, you can get two sticks and two potatoes or nothing. So the game scales that way. So this player who got 102 here would get two sticks, while this person who got worst would get two potatoes. And as you might guess, coming to the bottom here, these are worth three. So both three sticks and three potatoes. Finally, I'll explain the match at the bottom. If, when you're at the declarer, if you get no tricks at all, like don't win any cards, you would lose two points as the match, and then these other players would both get a point each. Conversely, if you run the table and win every trick, you would get two points and the other players would lose one. In addition to those match points, you would get 100 bonus points for your score. So you would take all the points, so 157 plus a bonus of 100. That is pretty much the game. There's some caveats to explain. Like let's say you passed the bid to someone else and they took it, they would have one contract filled 
more than you. And as you can tell, like as the, the math works, some players could just be done with contracts. If that's the case, the bidding would just go back and forth between the players who still have contracts left. And if you're the only one with contracts to do, you can't pass it all. Good luck, you're just going to finish out those contracts. <laughs> and final caveat, if there's ever a tie, like say the top two people both got 9 and 9 for the most, and you don't know which person gets the sticks, the game genuinely suggests to randomly cut a card and just give it to someone. We think it should go to the person who did the contract first. I think that's a good incentive. But again, the game says to do it random. You might not think that's happened, but in my games it's happened I think two or three times, so kind of an important rule. But hey, anyway, that is how you play Kofor Yes. And we're back with me and my alcohol. No time has passed. I have not sobered up. So that's how to play Kofor Yes. And I really, really like it. I might have a little bit looser lips right now, but I'll tell you, it gets the seal. That's right, an early seal. That's just who I am. The reasons I like the game. First off, it's a long game. It's tough to recommend this game and say it's a good game. But I do think if you want such a wild, wild experience that only a long game can give, then this is it. It's like one of those super long movies like Lawrence of Arabia or something, right? Where the length in and of itself, it lends so much to the game. It's part of the game's identity. When you finish a game of Kofor Yas, you've ran a marathon. It feels like you've done a huge feat with the other people at the table. And even if you win or lose or whatever, there's such a sense of like we did itness. Especially if you do it in one go, it's like what? It's like a movie marathon or something, or like a double feature, where you're sitting doing an activity for so long, you're like, whoa. We kind of went through it, right? To get to the gameplay, I love the fact that you're looking at your hand and you have the flexibility at the start of the game to try to call the contracts that are going to get you the most points and have that be your stake. Because as the game winds, winds, so it doesn't wind down. I was gonna say winds down, it doesn't really, it ramps up. So as the game kind of hurdles toward the finish line, those later contracts, you're gonna just have worse hands because you're just gonna be pigeonholed and forced into those contracts. So for example, the Slalom or even the Undinaba, the Obinaba, those type of contracts almost demand a certain type of hand. And if you delay for a long time, or if you, you know, if you push the barrel and someone else takes it and you're the one at the very end with all these like kind of forces, you find out quickly that that was a bad move and you are getting very few points on those contracts. So it's an interesting game where like, certain games like Food Chain Magnet or Catan, where the opening is pretty important, and especially for a longer game. And what I've noticed is sometimes people will mulligan hands on the trump. It's always funny because like, if you mulligan a lot at the start and are just like tiptoe, if you kind of babysit too much in the game, you just get forced into even worse situations down the line. It's really cool how like, it favors bold moves in almost like a, not an unintuitive way, but after the first game of it, you're like, oh wow, I might have misinterpreted the leniency I had the whole game. <laughs> Again, I've been unintentionally drinking, so I might just be rambling at this point, but the fact that the game is so open and is so long is almost like a trick it plays on the players. You don't realize the tunnel collapsing until it's too late in a way. It's really, really funny. The game gives you the agency with the, with the jokers to choose when you want to triple a contract that you could just have keep it normal otherwise. So for example, maybe this is my strategy, but whenever I choose jokers, or like a lot of times when I do choose jokers, it's with the trump suits, because I found that those contracts are pretty easy to judge, especially for beginners, uh, where I'm at, <laughs> for sure. I haven't played this game like too, too much, just because it's so long, right? It's hard to play this game as many times, in quotes, as earlier games I've covered on the channel, just because one game is a huge investment. But again, it's interesting because like, even though it's one game, it's 36 hands, so I felt like I've played it a ton compared to other games I've covered on the channel, or at least as much. What I'm trying to say is I love seeing what people choose as their jokers, because do you do your joker as early as possible when you know you have a really good hand? Or do you keep it as that last minute flexibility in the game? Because then whatever you get at the end, 
you're not as pigeonholed, right? But then also it's worth three points, so you don't want to waste it at the end if you get a hand that isn't really good at anything, right? It's really cool. The game has such a wonderful sense of strategy to it that I think only the length and the number of hands allows for. The contracts themselves are pretty fun. I do have some tweaks I would make. Wink wink, I have a kind of variant on coffee jazz I might talk about later. But the fact that the earlier suits allow the players like mulligan hands because they're just worth one stick or potato or one like game point, right? It's nice to give players in such a long game additional ways to mitigate luck. Like they could push the barrel, but <laughs> often the barrel will just come back to them because they pushed it for a reason. And unless someone has a super great hand, they're just gonna push it again to kind of stiff over that person with a bad hand. The idea of if the barrel doesn't work, you still have the earlier contracts to kind of whiff on a hand. But again, what's interesting is the game kind of tricks you into thinking it's a longer game than it is. All that to say, what I've noticed is players will sometimes mulligan too much because they think, oh, it's such a long game and I have all this flexibility. And then they realize they're kind of in a situation where they don't have any more leeway and they're stuck doing the two and the three game point sticks, potatoes, contracts with just bad hands that they, that they maybe were a little bit too nervous of before. Another part of the game that I just absolutely love is you get that pretty honest comparison of how you did in a contract with the other players. It's really fun to see like apples to apples exactly down the rows, how well you do for every contract. And it's weird, <laughs> it's a weird sense of like sometimes bragging rights if you do super well, especially in those jokers. But also the idea that a lot of times in trick takers, if you do something, you might be like, oh, I didn't do too well because I got a bad hand, right? And maybe that's still true of this game. But what I mean is the moment you chose to do a certain contract is pretty comparative to the moment someone else chose to do a certain contract. Obviously not all the time, because you could just be pigeonholed into that contract. The fact that for most of the game, you chose to do a contract, they chose to do a contract, and then you see how well you did, it's almost just like the purest way to, sh to compare how good you are at bidding on a hand. I hope that was clear. <laughs> Again, I shouldn't drink alcohol. Obvious qualms with the game, it's very long too long. I mentioned, I, unless I cut it out, good luck on editing this Taylor. I mentioned earlier the idea of a variant that I had that kind of cleans up a little bit of the contracts and moves some things around. I do think there's too many Trump contracts. It's kind of a little bit too much padding for a game that, like it's a long game because there's a lot of hands and so maybe you need that padding because it's a long game, but then also the idea sometimes could be then cut out the padding for a shorter game so that you don't need the padding. I hope that makes sense. But I love the ups, I love the downs. Slalom's my favorite contract by far. Gustav makes sense. It has a pretty, pretty different feel from Slalom, even though it is somewhat the same idea, up and down. But I've loved the fact that like, Slalom is a, what's well, an easier contract than Gustav, because I think there's almost like a programming to it. I love looking at a hand and seeing if it's a good Slalom hand, but judging off of both how many sixes or sevens, or you know aces or whatever that I have in my hand and bouncing around those so like let's say I have a six and seven of flowers and then also like the ace of flowers and then some other cards that will let me still maintain control during the slalom I can run those and be in control the whole time and then pay attention to what people are shorting because I love the idea of slalom where people don't know quite what to short like middle cards obviously but once you get to like three quarters through a slalom run, like if you really bid well on a slalom and you get to that three quarter mark, and then you start paying attention to what people are tossing, you can get to a point where people are tossing their sixes or their sevens in certain suits or their highest cards. They're starting to toss them off suit and they're trying to almost guess where the end of this slalom is gonna take you. And then noticing that and playing again off the slalom. So it's really cool how the slalom is almost like a it's like a programming game in a way. And maybe there's some bias there because I just love programming games like, you know, Robo Rally or whatever. But it's really cool to look at a hand and be like, I'll win this, I'll win this, I'll win this, I'll win this, I'll win this. And then around here, when the wheels might come off, I might be able to see if someone's short suited in that and then jump to that suit. 
It's so much fun. And I love when it goes to plan. There's been games where I ran the table on a slalom, and I think it it's just like one of my favorite trick-taking moments. It's just so much fun. The length is a funny thing because it is overall kind of a con. It's just like a long commitment. But there's so much pro to it that I wouldn't quite say it's a flat out con. It makes the game, I, I'm using the word epic here as like literally an epic, like the Odyssey and not epic as in like an explosion <laughs> or, that, or a cool gamer moment. Uh, but it's, it's literally like so long and has such a story that it builds throughout the whole game that it feels like an epic. And I guess we talked about this a little bit in Mazurka, but when there's a really long game, I think it has to balance the idea of tense moments and non-tense moments. If it's always tense, it just exhausts the players and just isn't fun to play. And then if it's obviously boring, you don't want to play a boring game for that long. In Mazurka, it was nice because you were either on the hook or not, and it kind of let you off the hook in a good flow. And this game does that just as well. Being on the hook for the deal and being able to pass it has a good mix of if you're not on the hook right now, you're still evaluating your hand in terms of A, what do you think they're going to bid? Like if you don't have any bells in your hand, you're like, ooh, they might bid bells as Trump because I have like no bells. And if they do, I'm like, ooh, I hope that doesn't happen. But also, if they pass it to you, then you have to be ready for that bid, right? So it's cool because you're always engaged, but it's a funny, like, loose engagement. Unless you're on the hook, right? <laughs> and what's funny about being on the hook is sometimes you can just pass it. It's never good, right? Because odds are either they pass it back to you and you're in the same spot and it's like, oh. or you pass it to someone and they have an amazing hand and they just, like, rock you, right? So um, the passing is a funny, like, is it that good? But it is, like, a nice kind of, like, release valve in terms of the idea of tenseness, right, in a long game. You release a little bit of that tenseness, you give the players a little bit of an out to make it so it's more of a casual game. I've played it to where the ending was kind of a blowout, so that can definitely happen. But what's interesting is it's usually somewhat close, and the game kind of has this, like I was saying, kind of, not runaway train, but like, <laughs> train, no brakes, that is a runaway train. You get the idea. It has kind of like a things going full throttle to the end because the contract picking gets shorter. So there's less like delay between hands. It's a really cool sensation of just like, oh, I'm forced to do this, I'm forced to do this, I'm forced to do this, I'm forced to do this. I put myself in this situation, ah! Right? Because you're just, <laughs> you took so much time picking what you want to do that then now that you're pigeonholed, you just play it out. And it's cool to have a game that takes a long amount of time because there is so much choice at the start and then once players maybe are getting a little bit tired it ramps up so the tension picks up and the hands just get more forced and crazy and like Ew. especially like the fact that if you i forget what it's called like but the match points were like if you don't take any trick or you are against someone and you take all the tricks right and the idea that like <laughs> if you don't run the table or if you do run the table or if you don't get any tricks that lends to super bad things or super good things i guess depending on your perspective. But the fact that like you can get pigeonholed with a hand and it isn't just like bad, like you won't win the contract, but you could lose a whole game point if you did it that bad. So every hand has a good amount of tense, not just like that hand tenseness, but like the game tenseness, which is really, really, really fun. Another like actual con I have is the deck makeup's just a little obtuse and takes a little bit to get used to. And uh, I, I might, I don't wanna ruffle too many feathers because I know people don't mind it or like it even but old-timey games are just old-timey for old-timey's sake and I think there's a little bit of gatekeeping there that it'd be really cool if this game could just be streamlined a bit there's just moments to where I would be a little bit hesitant well not only the length but I'd be hesitant to show people just because it's a little obtuse right and like in a super long game where the deck makeup can bounce out around a little bit or the deck makeup is a little bit goofy People will sometimes just like miss bid because they don't quite get the nuances of the deck or like kind of the systems in play. So that's always tough and you never want that to happen, especially if that happens like early on and they lose a contract from it. So that's another kind of like genuine caveat I'd say is 
it's an old-timey game, so it comes with the baggage of being old-timey. So I apologize to NA, your designs can be sometimes a little bit stale and old. Uh, and I apologize to whoever did design it. They're probably not on this earth anymore, so they're probably not watching this video. So that is Coffer Yas Coffee Jazz. And honestly, it's gone on a very long time. I've been recording for quite a while. I hope it feels that way to you. Not in a good way. I, I, I think this actually unintentionally felt like you're talking to someone who's just drunk and rambling with you at a bar and you're trying to get away, but you can't because you, you just can't say no to the space. I don't know. I don't know where I was going with that. But anyway, thank you so much for watching. I, you already saw at the beginning, it got the seal. So no, no need to do that. I think even despite that kind of old timiness and obtuseness and kind of length of the game, it's just so much fun. The fact that you have just a, a crazy bunch of choice and the evolving narrative of a hand and then the evolving narrative of like the whole game, it, it just leads to amazing moments and tense choices and a fun, <laughs> an always fun conclusion to the game. I uh, probably should let you go. I'm sorry for rambling. So I'll let you go. Just, uh, just be me and my gin here. So cheers. Thanks so much for watching. Bye.